and uh, dear colleagues uh, as all of you know we are here for a talk on current trends in genetic approaches to diagnostics and treatment of cancer and uh, we welcome our speaker dr sudhir sena and before we start uh, let me uh, give a brief presentation of uh, dr sena uh, dr sudhir sena is the founder ceo and president of innogenomics technologies and founder and chief scientific officer of Kerex Genomics Incorporated, both research and development companies located in New Orleans. Uh, he is also an adjunct professor of uh, biochemistry and uh, molecular biology at the School of Medicine, Tulane University, as well as a fellow of the American Academy of Forensic Sciences. Dr. Sena previously in the year 1990 established Relaging Technologies an accredited DNA testing lab located in uh, New Orleans and served there as president and lab director until it was acquired by Orchid Cellmark in 2007. At Relagene, Dr. Sina commercialized uh, multiple molecular diagnostic tests as well as PCR amplification genotyping kits, including YPLEX, the first commercial Y string, sorry, YSTR. Uh, DNA profiling kit for forensic use. He was a member of YSTR database consortium established in the National Institute of Justice and awarded an export promotion award by the US Department of Commerce for his uh, DNA testing kit. For this uh, DNA testing kit, yes, and uh, uh, with over 36 years' experience in chemical and biochemical research and management, uh, Dr. Sina is well recognized in the international scientific community authoring numerous research papers and holding uh, various patents. Dr. Sina has chaired various workshops and scientific sessions at the American Academy of Political Sciences and at the American Association of Blood Banks annual meetings. For the purposes of expert witness testimony, Dr. Sina has been qualified as an expert in molecular biology and DNA analysis in 24 jurisdictions throughout the United States. Uh, he was uh, chairman of the board of directors of Forensic Quality Services and ISO 17025 accrediting organization for forensic laboratories. Dr. Sina can, uh, was a, a member of Louisiana State Medifund Board appointed by the governor and uh, currently is an active member of the American Society of Clinical Oncologists, American Association of Cancer Research, and American Academy of Forensic Science. So this was uh, an introduction. Now over to you, sir. We, we once again welcome to you. The, uh, welcome, welcome you to the session, sir. And with a request to kindly start the talk. Okay. So I need to share the screen. So I think you need to have. Somebody has to go to, let me allow, to is it, can I share the screen now? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. yes, sir. Just click on present now, sir. Bottom, uh, right bottom of the window, sir. OK. Yes, sir. Yes, yes sir. You're sir. about to come. Start, sir. Yes. How about now? Can you see my screen? Uh, no, sir. Right now, it's uh, uh, presentation is stopped, sir, I think. So what happened? Present now. Our entire screen. And no, not, not entire screen, sir. Uh, particularly the PowerPoint screen. Let me share a window. Yeah, share a window. 
Okay, here. Okay. All right, got it. Can you see it now? Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We can see the presentation. Okay. Let so, me get started. Yes, sir. Okay. So that's the title, Current Trends in Genetic Approaches to Diagnostic Treatment in Cancer. So it's basically molecular uh, diagnostic. Uh, you know, Ramnis gave in Jackson. I wanted to show you before, like I was a, a student in Rachi. I did my honor and master in Rachi in PhD from Kanpur, and then in chemistry, and then I changed in biochemistry uh, in Miami. And so I just wanted to let you know that uh, things can change. People, I did my PhD in theoretical chemistry. I never thought I'll be doing this work after that, but it's quite possible. It took a lot of work, but it, can, it is possible. So now I want to give you a little history uh, and want to start, uh, you all know about it. So I want to get that. See 50, almost 50 years ago, um, uh, for Watson and Crick uh, wrote this word, said this is the, from their paper, the first paper. In other words, if an adenine forms one member of the pair the, on the either chain, then on these assumptions, the other member must be a thymine. Similarly, if a guanine a, uh, and a cytosine, so if there is a G, there is a C, there is a A, there is a T, in the opposite strands of the DNA. And if only specific pair of bases can be formed, it follows that the sequence on the other chain is automatically determined by knowing the sequence on the one chain. This is the first start of the genetic understanding, you know, molecular level understanding of the genetics of diseases uh, and many of the thing which we're going to talk about it. You know, this talk is basically molecular diagnostic, genetic diagnostic. So once you have that, the two strands of DNA, that gave rise to different types of approaches to test for the systems. So for the molecular diagnostic, actually in 1980, uh, there was a hybridization. So what you do, you have a DNA strand, two strand, you make a probe, and the probe is simply the complementary, small 20, 30 base pairs, complementary sequence. Like on the main template, if it's a A, the probe has a T in that position, and the G and C, that's the way it goes. So you can make a complementary sequence of a small piece of oligonucleotide, and then you can attach that with a radioactivity, or a, nowadays people do with fluorescence, but initially we did with radioactive P32 attached to it. And if you mix it with the DNA, the DNA probe will go and bind to this special place where the sequence match. And that way you can see whether this specific sequence is present in your sample or not. If the sequence represents a disease, yeah. Sorry, sorry, a lot of people. Yeah. Please. Yeah. 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 Yes. Can you hear? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You can hear you. Yeah. Okay. So the, this was allowed to there is so much echo is there can you uh, mute everybody mute there is uh, um, computers or a cell phone then would be better okay the other seminal uh, this what allowed is what you call restriction fragment length polymorphism so you know you run the dna you do, you cut it with restriction enzyme which cuts in specific places in the DNA, like if there is a sequence of AGCG, it will cut only there. And then 
you have pieces of DNA and then you attach the, you transfer the, uh, the gel onto a nylon membrane. And first time the person did his name was E.M. Southern. And that's what he called Southern blot, transferring the DNA from the gel onto a nylon membrane and fixing it there and then putting the probe with radioactivity and ex binding it and then exposing to X-ray plate. This was a technique I used uh, many times for doing the sequence and everything. Uh, things have changed. The interesting thing I wanted to mention that this scientist's name was E.M. Southern and later somebody make a parody in terms of there is a Western blot for protein transfer and there is a Northern blot for RNA transfer. They are not the name of the scientist. The Southern blot was the name of the scientist for DNA. So the first, uh, this is a very interesting development. The next development in this field happened was by uh, Curry Mullis. Curry Mullis uh, just died last year. Uh, he, he was a scientist uh, at the university um, in uh, um, California. I forgot the name, I think in Berkeley or Stanford, I forgot. Uh, he was a scientist there, and then he joined a company called Cetus Corporation. And in that company, he was a scientist. And we were doing, when I was doing initial work in Miami, uh, you know, to make a copy of the DNA, um, you have to use an enzyme called polymerase. And that enzyme um, works at 60 degree, and the every cycle, and I'll show you what I mean by the cycle, the enzyme used to die when I used to heat it. Um, the heat, it was not heat stable because it was normal bacterial enzyme. Curry Mullis, whose picture is I can show, I'm showing you, uh, went to, there is an area in, in uh, US, it's called Yellowstone Park. If you, Yellowstone Park really looks like uh, if you saw, saw in the movie, uh, Alien Planet. It has geysers, it has, uh, you know, geyser hot water throwing up more than 100 feet up in the air. And there on that hot water, boiling water, which is very highly acidic, sulfuric acid, uh, because there are a lot of sulfur in that area in the rock. Uh, that sulfuric acid, so strong, acidic and hot water. There are some bacteria growing, yellow bacteria. That's why the whole park is named as Yellowstone Park. Uh, so Curry Mullis went to that uh, Yellowstone Park. People go there. I also went there, camped there, and saw this uh, wonderful air, uh, state park. Um, so he went there. And you see how I, I wanted to narrate this story for you to understand how a big discovery can be done by a very observant scientist on a very simple way. He saw that yellow bacteria and immediately it came to his mind that this bacteria might have an enzyme which can copy DNA because it's growing, so it must be copying its DNA, copy DNA at hot temperature and will not die. And that's where there is a thermostable enzyme polymerase. Uh, he, he took the bacteria uh, from the Yellowstone, brought it to the lab, grew the bacteria, and isolated the enzyme. You know, that work he did uh, in 1980, you know, middle of 80, in 1990, that uh, became a polymerase chain reaction. And I was fortunate in 92 uh, to go to his lab and attend a one uh, week workshop to learn how this PCR process works from him and one of his postdoc, a Japanese scientist was there, his postdoc. He was the one who mostly taught our class. In 92, I went there, 93, he got the Nobel Prize for his work. And uh, this PCR technology now, no matter what you do, genetic diagnostic, molecular testing, molecular DNA, 90% of the genetic testing are now based on this technology, PCR technology. I wanted to come back to simple few of the technology, how it is used for doing diagnostic assays. So PCR and qPCR, I'm giving you then quantitative PCR. 
at one time it was called real time pcr also is the same thing and then rt pcr is reverse transcriptase pcr uh, that's used to assay the coronavirus test uh, diagnosis of presence of coronavirus uh, that's uh, is reverse transcriptase pcr and there is a new technology called digital pcr developed in 2016 and then there is ngs which is called next gen sequencing next generation sequencing this is the most exciting development that has happened over last 5 6 years um where and i'll touch a little, little bit in all these techniques so you should know and how the whole field of biotechnology is applied to medicine see these are the techniques if you go to do your masters or something make sure you learn these techniques if somebody applies for a job in my place and says i have done digital pcr or i have done q pcr um, their chances of getting hired increases tremendously because these are the latest technologies which everybody uses and then there are some application of bioinformatics you must have heard about that and machine learning as well uh, in this and i'll show you where that apply and then finally the latest technology is called liquid biopsy and that's where my research is and i'll present the liquid biopsy uh, this is kind of a tumor biopsy you guys have looked at the cells or something under the microscope and you see stain it and then you see whether the cancer cells uh, or other types of cells like neonatal diagnosis or others uh, a chromosomal defect you can see the staining pattern and you can understand that instead of doing the staining of the cells we can do the same detection using dna and that's why it's called liquid biopsy okay now there is some introduction to pcr molecular biology this is basic 101 um see this is a dna st strands on the left you see that there are two strands they are double helix um and they they are uh, here are the nucleotide g a t a g a u c and the opposite strand has c t a t c t so there is you see this is uh, watson and crick's uh, model if there is a a the other side has a t if there is a g the other side has a c this is very specific if if this changes Say suppose they instead of a or g there is some other nucleic acid then this other strands will not bind to it and this specific address of the genome gives us tremendous ability see the whole genome whole human genome 23 chromosomes and all the dna in the chromosomes are just combination of these four letters i tell people just imagine that you have a computer has the language 0101 right like all the things are coded with 01 and permutation combination of that and here we have four we have four letter codes and you can make so many combinations and so many sequences of these four letter codes and these things are coding the genetic code for an individuals and this is what is passed on from the parents to the child every individual sitting there in the room has half of its dna coming from the mother and roughly other half of the dna coming from the father the mother's dna strands there is another one additional dna mother gives which is called mitochondrial dna so the mother gives one additional dna than the father uh, so xy and xx you see that's the uh, sex chromosome but everything else is uh, in all the all the chromosomes half half is contributed by parents and their half is contributed by their parents so every individuals carry one fourth of their grandparents gene so there is it's really we are all connected to our previous ancestors through our genes and mother gives one extra piece of dna which is called mitochondrial dna uh, which has a very important function um, very interestingly 
the mitochondrial DNA is, provides the power for the cells. And so, you know, in, in our mythology, uh, power uh, goddesses are the god of power. And here also the gene provided with the uh, mitochondrial DNA from the mother. So I, I deviated a little bit. So here, the first step of the PCR is that you heat this double strand of DNA up to 95 degrees. When you heat up to 95 degrees, the two strands sub separates. That's what we call melting. So we melt the DNA and separate the two strands. That's the first step in the polymerase chain reaction. The second step is you have a synthetic probe. This is primer. So synthetic piece of DNA, wherever in the whole genome, which is uh, about 3.2 billion nucleic acid in the one human gene, genome. Out of 3 billion nucleic acid, wherever you make a specific piece of sequence, this probe will go and bind exactly there. So the probe goes or primer goes, we call it primers here. Primer goes and bind and you see it's matching matching uh, you know, sequences. So it's complementary. It's not exactly the same. It's like a mirror image, left hand and right hand. So it attaches there. So that's the second step. We call it annealing. And what we do, we heat the DNA to 95 degrees to separate and cool the DNA to 60 degrees to attach this pro primers into it. So that's the second step of the polymerase chain reaction. And the third step is, which is the curry mullis discovery is very important, is this, uh, you add the free nucleic acid into the solution and you add this polymerase chain enzyme. This is the enzyme, which is thermostable enzyme. So you add the enzyme and what it enzyme does is like a proofreading uh, thing. It just looks at all the letters and fits the new letters exactly the same as in the, and extends the small piece which you added, synthetic piece, it keeps extending over the chain. So like if the T was there, it attaches A, A was there, attaches T, C was there, attaches G, and it keeps going that way and keep attaching new pieces, making new pieces of duplicate DNA. Okay, so that's the extension. These three together, now what happened, you started with one molecule of DNA, you separate it to two, and then you got another new molecule of DNA generated. So what happens in first cycle, and each cycle takes only two minutes. So you heat it to 95 degrees for 30 seconds, you go down to 60 degrees for 30 seconds. You, you leave it there for one minute or 45 seconds. And you again heat it up to 95 degrees. So one molecule of DNA became two molecules of DNA. And then two, now they separate again. You heat it again and you copy again. Now it became four. So it, you see that the progression is exponential here. And it is, uh, you know, two to four, four to, you know, every cycle is doubling. Every cycle it's doubling. By 28 or 30 cycle from a single DNA piece, you can make almost a billion copies. And that's the advantage and the power of the polymerase chain reaction, PCREs. Like even if you have a very small amount of DNA, you can, and if you want to see is this particular DNA is there is not. This particular DNA is disease associated. Let me see if this person has or not. And the person may have very, very few, maybe 1% of that, 0.1% of that. Doesn't matter. You put the probe, is especially you know the sequence, then you make a, pro, a primer, you put it in there, and you just put it into a, a thermocycler, which is just heat and cool, nothing. And you put it heat and cool, and let it go automatically. Before when I was doing every cycle has to add new polymerase and that was tedious and it was not possible. But with Curry Mullis discovery of thermostable polymerase, 
you can make copy as much as you want. But of course, after 30 or 40 cycle, you know, you can, it goes, background starts coming because there's so many copies. And now you have copies which you can do whatever test you want. This is the basic, basic application of diagnostic application of genetics. This is the basic principle. Now I want to show you what is the quantitative PCR is. And these are the things is my research. I'll, look, uh, I'll show you in liquid biopsy as well. But here, see, there is a, uh, you know, uh, there, I don't know you guys remember or not. There was one, uh, uh, one game which was called Pac-Man. The Pac-Man uh, yeah, was Nintendo game. So the, the, the uh, scientist at the, um, uh, you know, Roche uh, gave the name Tac-Man. So this is called TACMAN assay. TAC is thermostable polymerase. So TACMAN assay. So the way it is here, that you have a template, that's a, a, a DNA piece, and you want to know how much quantification of this DNA is. So if you want to know, you add a primer. Like here, we are trying to find out, most of the people say have G is in this place, but some person who got disease, the G got changed to A. So if you put the other side T, and this is very specific, even one single change in this uh, three prime range, this side is called five prime and this side is called three prime. Three prime range where the extension starts, uh, if it is mismatch, it will not happen. So you put the area exactly matching thing here, so you want to extend this to the other side, okay? And you put the primer in both side. So that way you, you bracket it. So you want to extend only this much piece, not unlimited size. So you want to ex extend it starting from this red uh, primer all the way up to the purple primer. And then in between, you put another same DNA sequence like matching uh, a complementary DNA sequence, which we call Tacman probe. And you put the probe. The advantage of the probe is that left side of the probe, which is the five prime range, the left side of the probe has a fluorescence dye. Normally we use a FAM dye, a, a hex dye, a rosaline dye. So a dye which can fluorescence if a particular wavelength of light is given. So you, you shine a particular wavelength of light, the light, it, it uh, fluoresces at a, uh, have an exciting, excitation wavelength and have a emission wavelength. And in that emission wavelength, you can see whether the, how much the dye is present. So you can uh, read that by a photometer. So here we got a probe which has a fluorescence in left side, and the clever part was that the right side, they put a quencher. So this quencher is so close to this fluorescence dye that when this probe is intact in solution, the dye does not fluoresce because dye is next to a quencher. And that quencher quenches the fluorescence of the dye. So you have this kind of, so you have, there are a lot of tools to design this kind of things. Computer tools are there and I've used all that to design. This is the key part. You know, if you become a scientist or become a, uh, a this you need to learn how to design a specific primer, a specific probes, which gives you the most correct result and below background and everything. So you design this and then look what happened. If you put this way and put the polymerase in here, and that's why it is called TACMAN, polymerase will start extending the red line. As it goes extending the red line, it hits the probe. It hits the probe and it runs like a rail track. There is obstructions. So if there is obstruction there, the polymerase has an activity which is called five prime endonuclease activity. So it, what it does, it cuts into pieces the probe and keep the red line extending 
until it reaches the primer, the pieces from the other side. So other side keep extending and the left side. And when it hits the probe, it cuts that fluorescence piece. When it cuts the fluorescence piece, that piece goes in the solution. Now you get a light. Before that, you don't see the light. So every copy, there is a more fluorescence keep increasing. And that way you can know, if you read it, you can know how much you originally started with. How much was the DNA in your solution to start with? This is the quantitative PCR, okay? And this is the mutation assay uh, uh, people use. They put a mutation specific primers uh, and the other, they put a blocker, which is a natural, which is most of the DNA is, except some mutated DNA. And this one goes, and uh, this does not, uh, you know, give a different um, color, whether uh, this gives a different color, if you put two different color fluorophore, and you can see how much is the mutation, mutated DNA is. And there is a reference dye and reference gene. So that's how you look at it, okay? So now, let me see what happened here. Uh oh. Okay. Now I'm going to say about RT PCR. RT stands for reverse transcriptase. There is an enzyme which is called reverse transcriptase. And what that enzyme does is take the RNA and convert RNA into DNA. So RNA uh, is another. Um, you know, molecule, which is the same nucleic acid, except one changes uh, in that instead of uh, thymine is a uracil there. Um, I don't want to go into detail, but like coronavirus is a RNA virus. So if you want to see if this particular RNA virus is there, RNA is there or not in everybody swab, which is collected from the nasal swab, you put the swab inside and you, do, you have to do one step extra. You have to add one enzyme, which is called reverse transcriptase, that makes a copy of DNA of that RNA, and then you do the same Tachman assay to detect how much um, virus particle was there. So I just wanted to add this one extra step. And nowadays there, is a, there are a, a solutions which everything is mixed. So you don't have to do, there is no difference uh, yeah, you, it will look like as if you are doing the simple DNA qPCR. That's how most other people do. And I can show you one step and two step. In one step, everything is added together. In two step, first you treat with uh, uh, transcriptase and then you do qPCR. Another latest technology is called digital PCR. It's very, is a digital droplet PCR actually. So digital PCR um, is, is not digital computer. It is still uh, uh, uses, still is uses the same technology, PCR technology, which I showed you before. <clears throat> the difference here is that what they did, and this very latest technology, 2016, uh, it was developed. Uh, the, you take a piece for solution, and instead of adding a probe, uh, uh, to fluorescence tag or things like that, uh, people thought, well, we need to know from a starting material how it's easier if we can just count the molecules. So in this case, what you do, you take a solution, a small amount of, say, your DNA solution, and then you mix with a oil, uh, and then you atomize it at such a level that, and put it into a small, small droplet onto a plate. And you dilute it so much that some of the droplet has no DNA and some of the droplet has just a single molecule of DNA. So you separate into a whole range of, in a plate where you have, some has no DNA, some has single DNA. That's the key. There is a machine which does that for you. So you can do that. If you do that, so measurement is performed by dividing the sample into partition, 
that partitions that each of these either zero or one target molecule present in individual reaction. Now each partition is analyzed after endpoint PCR. So you just do PCR, like I said, no probe, no color, fluorescence colors are needed. You just do a PCR. And if there is a PCR product there, what happens, double-stranded DNA, it creates more double-stranded DNA, uh, and more copies of that. And then double-stranded DNA has a special property that there is a chelating, there is an intercalating dye called cyber green and the dye goes inside the two strands of DNA. And once it enters into the two strands of DNA in the middle, in the group, it starts giving fluorescence. So that way you can add that and wherever the molecule was, you can see a dot. Wherever the molecule was not there, you can see just the plain color what was in the, uh, in the solution. So you can have two different color a two color dots. One dot shows there was no DNA in there. One dot shows there was a single molecule of DNA in there. Okay, so each partition analyzed and molecule present in the sample calculated. Now you can just count it. Count the molecule through a microscope type of device. And uh, of course they have digital device and you can count and see how many DNA molecule you have in this much solution. So you can quantitate it. And you can do a mutation analysis. And I'll explain what mutation is um, for you guys. And uh, it does rely on a standard curve. You know, just it eliminates reliance on a standard curve. Because qPCR, you need to compare your DNA with a known DNA. So that's the difference. OK, here is a picture of a digital uh, droplet PCR uh, results. Wherever you see that uh, dark, uh, bright spots, that's where the DNA was. And where you don't, there was no DNA in those droplets. Now you can count how many DNA molecules was there. So you can really look at each molecule separately. You're not looking at one molecule. You're looking at multiple molecules because you did PCR. So you made so many copies of one single molecule. That's why PCR gives you the ability to look at it. You cannot by naked eye, you, you can look at this by naked eye really, uh, uh, if you put under a UV light. So you, you cannot see uh, a single molecule with naked eye, but it's not a single molecule actually, it's a billion molecule there, but it is started with one molecule. Now I come to a last technology. This is the next generation sequencing technology, which is very, very useful in molecular diagnostic and cancer diagnostic. And the whole gen genomic field is so exciting and growing so rapidly because of this NGS technology, which has happened. You know, when I was doing my postdoc, uh, it took me uh, two years to sequence one protein called transferrin, human, you know, blood protein. Uh, nowadays, uh, people sequence the whole virus in one or 10 days. Uh, the coronavirus whole genome sequence was known in 10 days because of this NGS technology. Um, because this is a next generation sequencing. What is that is not, originally we were doing Sanger, which Sanger was the name of the scientist, Sanger sequencing. You don't need to do that. The high throughput DNA sequencing technology, millions and billions of DNA strands can be sequenced in parallel at the same time. So you take the whole genome, you break into small pieces, and you attach those pieces into a plate, one end of the piece into a plate. And then you copy, you make PCR, and you know the sequence of each step um, by whole like 1000 pieces of DNA at one time within few hours. And that way the whole genome and you keep sequencing, keep sequencing it. And then you use computer to match and align the sequence and know the whole sequence of the genome. This is a very, very interesting technology. Very, very useful. Very simple machines has come. There are many uh, Iron Torrent is one of the machine, actually Iron Torrent technology developed by one of the, one of the person whom I know personally, uh, an Indian person uh, from Chennai. 
he was working with a company thermo you know applied bio system and he worked on this technology and uh, there are other my my sick which is for illumina there is a nano string there are uh, two three four uh, companies who make the machines and is very simple technology uh, once you have is fully automated you just put your dna sequencing and you get and you need to learn uh, bioinformatics that's what i i have brought there so let me come to this little bit more next step so ngs in cancer which is so important this is the latest thing and i want you to you guys to understand not only for future research or going into it uh, in this area but uh, you know cancer is so much pervasive in the society everybody knows somebody uh, or some who has uh, gone through or the family or somebody has gone through a cancer this is the latest thing i want you guys to understand a little bit what is the latest in the cancer research so whole genome wide sequence of the cancer cell is the latest thing you if somebody has a cancer they take the cancer cells take the normal cells uh, from the area different area of the body of the same patient and then you do the whole genome sequencing using ngs of the cancer cell and you do the whole genome sequencing of the normal cell so many cancer associated variants have been discovered using this cancer genome sequencing whole genome sequencing also provides a comprehensive view of the changes in the specific tumor dna sample compared to normal dna whole genome sequence is well suited for comparing tumor versus match normal sample and discovering normal novel cancer driving mutations so this is the thing so see if you can for somehow take the pieces of uh, take the cancer cells get the whole genome from there sequence it get the normal cell and compare from the same patient now you are treating that particular patient's tumor you're not just blindly giving a drug which may work or may not work if you know the mutation present in the cancer Uh, of that particular patient there are many and let me show you that oh sorry it exited oh where is it oh god i went from the beginning again okay so there are you see that when you do this sequencing i said you need bioinformatics there is 3.2 billion nucleic acid in the whole genome now imagine you have that much data is not any individuals can do it by hand you need the computer to align the sequences to compare the sequences and then you find out what are the difference between the cancer and the normal for that particular person's cancer once you know that then here it is cancer causing mutations i'm showing you this once you know what changes see there are many what happens in the genome that there are mutations happen and i told you i'll explain what mutation is and how it happen you know mutation doesn't mean that somebody has a, a five arms mutation is a small change in the genome which is uh, uh you can see here the first part is a uh, mutation here the first picture on the top so you see the sequence is going there and there is a, a at and gc is all matched what happens if one of the g is got changed by deletion see here the deletion what happens the one strand of the dna somehow got and there are in the genome there are hot spots where these kind of things happens so polymerase just missed one letter see polymerase missed one letter now there is one letter is missing now just many changes like that everybody gets by aging that's why cancer or other things happens more in old age uh, 
but there is some mutation accumulation happens by aging. This mutation is accelerated by environment like smoking for sure is known. And there are other things by what your eating habits say, you know, everybody, somebody eats at McDonald, of course, is going to get more mutation accumulated. So these are the things, um, lifestyle um, changes causes mutation. Um, so you have a deletion, sometime an insertion happens, an extra piece gets inserts, inserted, and sometime a substitution. Most of the time it is substitution, uh, like a, a polymerase placed a wrong nucleic acid there. And once it placed a wrong nucleic acid, got copied, and then the wrong nucleic acid can continue to copy, uh, copy when the cell, cell multiplication happens. Now, why this single mutation is so critical sometime and sometime is not. As uh, I mentioned that day in the lecture, see Dr. Hargan Khurana gave the code that these three nucleic acid together uh, codes for a particular amino acid. And that's why that amino acid makes the chain uh, for the protein. So if a single mismatch happens or change happen, then it cannot make the particular amino acid which is supposed to go there. It, it makes a different one or it doesn't make one. It makes, misses one. See, a single change like that causes sickle cell anemia or Setax disease, Tay-Sachs disease, many of the disease by a single mutation. Just imagine you have 3 billion nucleic acid in your body copy every cells duplicating and copying and replacing itself. And even one change happens can cause a disease. How precise the body mechanism is to maintain the exact copy of your, uh, your DNA. And the DNA is the code like computer memory and it, it creates the protein and others based on the memory uh, the code of the DNA. So the substitution happened and this is called mutation. Sometimes this mutation causes cancer because what happens, this mutation may cause changes in a protein and cell has a very specific regulation. When you see cells grows, baby cells grow faster, uh, people's cells grow all the time uh, or replace all the time. You get your skin cut and new skin grows on top of that. Uh, always happens. So once that cellular growth happens, there are a lot of controls and checks and balance on the cell. So once the cell reaches what it wants to be, the growth, then the growth stops. And there are some checkpoints and things like that people call in cancer cell uh, uh, genetics. So that checkpoints stop it growing any further. What if there, there is a mutation and this check, these things are get uh, out of sync and then the cells cannot stop growing? That's what the cancer is. So this mutation causing cancers and there are several ways these changes in the de gene happens. I showed you deletion, insertion, substitution. And then there is a hole in the, in the chromosome. There is a whole pieces sometimes miss. They fold and new copy just like since you have a rope and somehow the rope got folded and the train went in the other side of the track. Uh, so it happens that way. There's a deletion, the first one. Duplication happens. Many there is a diseases, there are many cancers which is caused by duplication of a particular piece of, a, if duplication has, and now the protein produ produced from this gen genetic code will be different completely. Inversion happens. Sometimes this comes down, this comes goes up. All these things can change as people have seen. Translocation from one chromosome to the other chromosome has also happened. So there is all these kind of things can happen during the copy and growth of the cells. And these are the causes of cancer. Many of these causes cancer. So now if you have a way to sequence the patient's gene, and you see what happened here, then you can do something for the treatment of that patient. If this particular uh, enzyme doesn't work, you can give a drug which has that particular enzyme or treatment for that, or a, an extra enzyme is, uh, is acting, 
we can give inhibitors to that enzyme to stop that action of that. So this is a, the latest in cancer treatment. This is what is not just the radiation and chemotherapy. Radiation just kills the cell. Chemotherapy is poison, kills the cells, but kills no, a lot of normal cells as well. And in that process, but since cancer cells grow faster, they kill most of the cancer cells. But this is a specific treatment directed towards the cancer cells. And there are many, many mutations nowadays, which people use uh, to look at that and design treatment and design uh, monitoring of the treatment. And this is happening and there is a immuno uh, treatment also available based on this uh, uh, genetic uh, studies. So checkpoint inhibitors and others, which is very, very exciting. Lung cancer, uh, there is treatment based on this kind of genetic uh, research. So now I come to liquid biopsy. This is here, my research I'm going to talk now. The liquid biopsy is using DNA in the blood to detect, track, and treat cancer. So instead of looking at the cancer cell, we can look the DNA pieces in the blood and it makes it easy so you don't have to do bio biopsy. So in the blood, say, this is a picture of the lungs, lung cancer. So, or, or uh, sorry, where it went. So when you have that, there is a cancer cells, there is normal cells, the blood circulating, this is a vein, the blood circulating in this vein, there is a cells, the inside the nucleus of the cells is your whole DNA, but outside the cell is the plasma. And the plasma sometime when the cells, the cancer cells grow, then it breaks down. It breaks down, it sets a small, small pieces of DNA. And those small pieces of DNA circulate in the blood, and then it it dies. It gets cut by enzyme within 24 hours, 48 hours. But for 24 hours, the immediately degrading D, uh, cancer cells DNA are floating in the blood. So if you take the blood of a cancer patient, and if you try to look in the plasma, the DNA, and you identify the DNA, what DNA it is or you quantitate the DNA, you can know how much is the cancer cells are growing or is shrinking. If the cancer cells are shrinking, there will be less pieces of that cancer mutation DNA. If the cancer cells are growing, there is more amount of the cancer cells DNA in the blood. That's what is called liquid biopsy. So you're not doing the biopsy of the cancer cells. You are just looking in the blood and this very simple, you draw a blood, you send to the lab, lab looks at the DNA, is a one day test, and the next day you know what's happening to the patient, whether the cancer is growing or not, and you don't have to wait three months to do CT scan. So that's the exciting part. So tumor DNA may aid many precision cancer treatment. Now you are either personalized cancer treatment or precision cancer treatment. In 2016, FDA approved, I'm just giving you one example. FDA approved a drug, a test for the EGFR mutation. Okay, epidermal growth factor protein has a mutation and the, uh, that mutation causes cancer. So they approved the test for that. And then based on EGFR mutation, uh, function of epidermal growth factor, uh, there are a lot of drug came out, cancer treatment for cancer treatment for those patients. So these are the names of the drug, you know, erlotinib. They are all tinibs in the end. They put uh, osimer tinibs and uh, there is uh, different types and different brand names have different names on that. So these are just uh, molecules, which is the cancer drug. They give it by IV. This is, these are the very expensive, of course, because the, it is specifically directed to that particular gene, EGFR gene, and it's working very well. So there is treatment with, uh, you can do some chemo uh, or some surgery and then treat with this kind of a specific, uh, it is, uh, uh, you know, mutation directed treatment. And also looking at the blood test, 
you can see whether EGFR mutation in the patients are level, the blood level are going up or going down, and you can see the treatment is working or is not working. So it's so much useful, so much simple, and so much easily can be done. Okay, CT scans are currently a standard. They are used for cancer response for patients, which is done every three months or six months in some places. Uh, some hospitals say here, MD Anderson in Houston does every two months uh, for their patients. Um, so, but it's expensive, it's a radiation, and uh, it's not that every hospital is not equipped with it. But lab test, QPCR as a, a machine is very cheap, $30,000, $40,000. It can be done anywhere, everywhere. Uh, liquid biopsy test has been added. Advantage of providing molecular information about the cancer is not just looking at the whole size of the cancer, but is looking, you know, which can change during and after the treatment. This additional information could potentially help doctors track the development of the drug resistance cancer also. Sometimes the drug works initially, and I'll show you some picture of my data. Drug works initially, and then they stop working. And we can know very quickly uh, by doing the liquid biopsy that the drug is stopped working. Rather than waiting for another three months, in the meantime, the cancer grows in the patient, patient get, gets weak, and then you do the CT scan and then say, oh my God, cancer has spread all over the body. So make more personalized treatment decision for each individual. So, you know, cancer is not, is basic mechanism is same, but is not same in every individual. Uh, so that's the one advantage of this. Uh, and it's much cheaper uh, and can be done quickly. So now I will show you my assay, which is we call, we call it Alibrex assay, Alibrex liquid biopsy test. So Alibrex uh, assay is a re really qPCR assay and uh, it's a patented. I got a grant from National Science, National Cancer Institute in 2015 uh, to look at the liquid biopsy. So we have a patent and I did, you know, before, um, as you saw in my resume, I, I was I was running a, a forensic DNA lab, and ran. I started with a forensic DNA lab in 1991, and I sold in 2005 uh, to LabCorp. So now, uh, during this uh, forensic testing, uh, we had a challenge that uh, if the body is burned or degraded or the sample of DNA is really damaged, if the bone is buried in the grave um, uh, for many, many years and people excavate the bone, how do you test uh, which, which person is this, whose person bone is this? Um, in fact, I, I was hired by government of Panama to look at, there was a dictator uh, who any students, uh, mostly students, oppose the dictator. The police come to their home and say, uh, go to the police station and family never saw their children again, those college students back again. Now the government has changed and the government hired uh, me and my lab to go and find the bones and uh, identify the remains so that they can be given back to their family. And it was thrown all over in the military barracks, buried inside the wall and things like that. So do, do this kind of test. We had a lot of challenges. So during that process, I developed an assay where we can look at a very, very small amount of highly broken down degraded DNA. So I had a patent already on that. And when the Cancer Institute put out to look at degraded DNA in the blood, I thought maybe I can apply that technology and applied for a grant. I got a grant from them called SBIR grant, a small business innovative research grant. And that grant, I developed this test. Um, uh, and uh, based on this test, we have a new company called KDEX Genomics. So measure the concentration of circulating tumor derived small DNA fragments in the blood. So that's what the Alibrex assay is. So it's a qPCR assay. These key features of that qPCR kit is a qPCR assay. And what I have done is three different sizes of DNA. 
uh, so 80 base pair of DNA, 80 nucleotide, 265 base pair of DNA, and also a synthetic gene I've made, designed, put it there, which is called internal positive control. So all three, as I showed you in qPCR, the fluorescence tag, you can put it, and fluorescence color gives a different specific wavelength color. So here what I did in one tube, one single test tube, I put all the primers. So there are two primers for each, a probe for each. So three, three things with a different color for 80 base pair, another three things for a different color for 265 base pair, another three designed uh, primers and probe in a different color for internal positive control. So about nine different uh, primers, uh, uh, you know, synthetic pieces of DNA and three different fluorescence color. So here I use namely FAM and sci-fi. I'll show you what colors we are using. And we selected a gene and to look at it, a small copy, uh, a small fragment, and is a little different than the mutation and I'll show you what it is. Uh, we look at a gene, um, I have selected a gene which is called retrotransposon <clears throat> and RE stands uh, for retrotransposon, retrotransposable elements. Uh, it was discovered many, many years ago by Barbara McIntosh. You know, she saw uh, uh, that one piece of corn has different color um, uh, corn, corns in there. And you might have seen it. Some yellow corn has a red, a red piece in there. So she looked at, based on that, she thought there are, there are genes who cross over uh, from one location to other location and she called it jumping genes. So those jumping genes are retrotransposons and their name is ELU. One is named called ELU, another is SVA. And actually the scientist who discovered this uh, ELU uh, gene uh, is a professor in Tulane Medical School where I am also a professor. So working with him, uh, I picked up in 2000 for last, uh, oh my God, last 20 years, I've been working on these genes. So using that particular gene, I applied for cancer diagnostic. So hey, what is this ELU G elements? It is a 300 base pair long, and it is a piece of uh, uh, RNA polymerase, uh, three oligo. The interesting thing, you know, these are their property. The interesting thing is that 300 base, base you know, base pair long and is repeated all over the genome. And let me show you how it is. Here it is. So these are two models, of course, now uh, it's still controversy how it copies. So these are the jumping genes I mentioned. So if there is one single uh, location, the gene, the 300 base pair is, it has an ability to locate itself into a different location on the genome. So it can, so it stays where it was originally, it makes a copy and insert in a new place. And this insertion doesn't happen so easily. There is some active, this kind of retrotransposon in us, which is called L1 and uh, which also accommodates and that also can cause disease, but not as active. We are talking about these in, insertion in terms of millions of years. So it copies made uh, uh, and uh, it grows and grows and grows into a genome. Right now, about 10% of the human genome is composed of this kind of retrotransposons. So you can think how many, how many of those are there in the human body. So we have, and here is a very interesting slide. So you can see this particular uh, uh, retrotransposon has an ancestry into bacteria. It came from bacteria, and this is a evolutionary tree. You can see that uh, bush baby, uh, uh, owl monkey, uh, this retrotransposon, and then about uh, 200,000 copies 25 million years ago, it separated, it more mutations generated into it and became a new piece. Uh, so green monkey, orangutan, and then gorillas, then chimps, and then human. So there is some human specific 
retrotransposon, which sequence is only present in humans and not in bacteria as others. Part of that is some is present in chimps and gorillas, but not in any other uh, species. So this gene is very useful for doing this kind of cancer test. That if even if the cancer patient has um, other kinds of uh, Oh my God, we already one hour. So let me finish that. This, um, this genetic materials is all over in every chromosome. Okay. So this is what I have designed. One of the ALU marker, one of the SVA marker, and you can see the QPCR assay and three targets. This is an interesting slide. I want to show you that. So look at the, it's very complicated, but look at the graph on the right side, this side picture. If you take a cancer cells, the DNA fragment, and this is one of the mutation, KRAS mutation is colon cancer patients normally have this mutation. If you look at this, uh, there is a curve here, the, the one curve in the cancer patients. So if you look at only 100 base pair, then you see the normals don't have any of that, very few. But the cancer patients have significant amount, about 0 0.005 density of the fragments. So what we are measuring, what my assay, Alibrex assay is, how much this small pieces of DNA is present, which is coming from the cancer cells into the blood. And that's the liquid biopsy assay. And that's the patented assays. So here is a sequence and you can see the sizes on the left side. You can see the small sizes have the cancer uh, gene, uh, oncogene. Here is some of my results. This is from Jewish General Hospital, Montreal. The small piece on the left side is from the normal patient. You see the normal patients almost negligible amount of this, this small piece of DNA. Whereas this ALU gene I looked at, and the red one is the cancer patients. Look at the variations in there. And the green one are the treated, cancer treated cancer patients. So the amount of DNA decreased if a small fire in the treatment works. Okay, so this is the assay. Let me go quickly. Uh, here is my results. We did about 78 patients. Right now I'm doing clinical trial on patients. So the way we do, we did a 78 patient. Out of that, there are 18 patients by CT scan. We had a progressive disease and we were able to identify all of the 18 patients looking at the blood and looking at the small size DNA. A 100% specificity match with the CT scan for the progression disease. There are some patient which is non-progressive, but they also showed the, for my assay, the DNA decreased, but there were 14 patient who later became progressive. So initially the DNA decreased. This assay we are doing only two weeks after the patient start cancer treatment. And this is my team, which is working there. Uh, we got the grant. Most of the work is done by this lady here in the left from uh, second from the left. Uh, her name is Hiromi. Uh, she's a Japanese descent and she's very good scientist, have a PhD, and she has developed most of these assets for me. Thank you. Uh, you can ask any question. Of course, I took a long time, but. Yes, uh, if you have anything to ask, you can please raise your questions. Yes, anybody? Yeah, oh, yeah. just feel free to ask any question. No question is a bad question. Sir, oh, sir one question from my side. Sir. How do you see efficacy of vaccines of coronavirus with respect to the various mutations of the virus? Yeah, uh, fortunately, um, the coronavirus have this uh, 
um, uh, outside the spike protein, there is not much mutation uh, uh, in the binding site area of coronavirus virus. There are three, four different types of mutated uh, coronavirus is identified. Many has been identified actually every area is doing, but uh, yeah. the virus directed towards the binding of that protein uh, uh, and the size. And so vaccine can be generated. And since the vaccine is a DNA vaccine, uh, most of the vaccine under development is a DNA or RNA vaccine. It's very easy to introduce a change and change the vaccine for a particular virus mutation. So right now it is based on there is one mutation which is in China, another mutation happened in the European um, coronavirus uh, which came to US, that's what I know. Uh, I, I'm sure in India people are doing sequences, they have to do the whole sequence of the virus of several Indian population to know what kind of, where it came from, it came from China, came from Europe, or there is a new mutation there. Um, so uh, once they know it can be easily, but coronavirus, unlike uh, many other is uh, like HIV or others is not very rapidly mutating virus. So it can be right now what we have now after a year, it may change and um, like cold virus every year it changes some mutation. So you have, you have to take new vaccines. Okay. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Sir. So Thank you. Students, uh, students will be uh, having some questions in future, so you can always uh, uh, route it uh, through us, and we will definitely forward it to uh, Dr. Sinha. And uh, yeah, and sir, uh, Sinha, sir, uh, thank you very much for devoting so much of your time because I uh, briefed you about the people who will be attending your lecture, and you, I, I can see, I can uh, very well observe that you have very well fine-tuned your uh, things, and uh, definitely that would have. Been lot of time of yours thank you heartfelt thanks to you from uh, from training and placement cell here and uh, uh, this uh, uh, department of MLT and uh, most importantly from our director sir professor Sandeep Singh Solanki sir and uh, he wanted to be present in the lecture but actually he has to prepare for some meeting and that's why he was uh, he couldn't make himself available so from all of us here thank, thank you very much sir. I just want to tell one field, one thing to the students. This field is so rapidly growing. There is not many fields in science which is so, just like computers rapidly growing every day. This field of cancer treatment and cancer diagnostic uh, based on genetics is so rapidly growing field. It's very exciting field every day, new opportunity. But yeah, you have to go a little bit deep into the gene to understand what's happening in the patients. All right. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Dr. Sina. Thank you, sir. Dr. Sina. Hi. Dr. Sina. Yes. yes. Are you listening to my voice? Yes. 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 Yes, I can. As per, uh, as per the um, uh, information that uh, coronavirus is a mutant mm -hmm. and it is just uh, the man made virus. So, no. what do you think no. about this? No, it's not. Uh, see, man-made, uh, there are some viruses, adenovirus and other, which uh, scientists have made hollow in which you can make man-made virus. But those virus has signature, uh, a specific signature of, uh, uh, you know, when you attach a piece of gene, you have to attach a linker. And those kind of linkers are signatures uh, that's man-made, like any GMO, you can do a test whether this this crop is GMO uh, because there is a attachment. People did a study and did not find that coronavirus is a man-made. Uh, there is no specific signature. Now, I cannot say it cannot be done, but if it is done, somebody done so cleverly that there is no publication of this kind available. Oh. So it's not a man-made virus. The virus change, it's a SARS virus. There is several coronavirus already known to people. Cold virus is also a coronavirus. So SARS virus and bird flu virus, uh, those were coronavirus. So it's a very similar to SARS virus, but as I told in last lecture, that it has done couple of mutation changes, 
which makes it very highly infectious. And because of that, it became so highly infectious uh, because of the binding capacity of the virus to the cell is 20 or 30 times more than SARS virus. And the receptor for the virus binding is present in many cells in the human body. That's why the main difference is. But it's not, uh, I don't think personally, it's a man-made virus. OK. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. So, so uh, can we wind up the session, uh, Nia, sir? Can we wind up the session? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, yes. Uh, thank, yes, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thanks to you from all of us here, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you so thank much, you. sir, for your information.